I'm Baron Lawner. I'm uh, Chief of Minimally Invasive Scoliosis Surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery and have been for the past 10 years. I've been practicing in the area of scoliosis and spinal curvatures such as kyphosis and other areas <clears throat> for the past 25 years. And my focus has been on trying to find ways to improve patient outcomes uh, through minimally invasive procedures where there are smaller incisions and more rapid recovery than the standard operations and uh, less blood loss and uh, hopefully better long-term outcomes. And that's what we've been focusing on uh, in the last few years. And I look forward to discussing this uh, further. Well, the pediatric orthopedic uh, surgery program at, at Mount Sinai is not just a surgical program. It's also non-surgical. We see many patients from all over the world who are non operative, but also who require surgery for their scoliosis and pediatric spine conditions. I, I would say what makes us unique is that we are a, a gem in New York City and we're a gem in the country. We're situated on uh, Fifth Avenue, right, uh, right at uh, Central Park. And I think we welcome families uh, from uh, just down the street uh, to around the metropolitan and, and tri-state area throughout the country and from around the world with the same, I think, degree of compassion and uh, open-mindedness to the family and the patient's particular needs. And we're really focused on the patient on an individual level that I think sets us apart from other large institutions. We are a major um, institution. We're a large institution, but our hospital and our, our team, our staff, the nurses, the doctors, physical therapists, etc. Everybody's on the same page in caring for the, the patient as an individual. And I think that's what sets us apart from other programs. There may be a little less personal, personable. So my focus is on uh, pediatric scoliosis and other spinal curvatures, as I said earlier, such as kyphosis. Um, I also treat adult patients, and I think that gives me a unique perspective and perhaps also sets us apart from other programs uh, in which the surgeons and physicians only treat pediatric patients. <clears throat> Remember, pediatric patients become adult patients or become adult human beings who uh, live their lives and have uh, their own set of needs and circumstances based on their condition, whether they had scoliosis that was untreated as a child or scoliosis that was treated with a fusion or non-fusion procedure, and that will eventually follow them throughout their lives. So there's a natural history to that. And I think by treating my whole career, treating both uh, pediatric patients and adults, I've, I've learned a lot and been able to convey a lot, hopefully, of, of wisdom to our patients and their families. I treat uh, babies uh, to older patients in their, in their 80s and 90s sometimes. But our focus is on the pediatric patient. Uh, well, in the last several years, probably the last five years now, uh, I have turned my attention and our program has turned its focus to the area of non-fusion scoliosis correction. The, the standard treatment has been a spinal fusion in which we correct the curvature, we place screws and metal rods, we fix the spine, we change the body shape and, and improve the alignment of the spine, but we take away motion in the segments that we operate on. For most patients, especially early on in their lives following the surgery, they do very well following that procedure. They have a good correction, they get back to most of their activities. But in some patients, uh, they lose some of their flexibility and their ability to carry on activities uh, that require a lot of motion, such as dance and gymnastics and swimming and it impacts their ability to play sports. And others will develop back pain and neck pain over the years following the spinal fusion because all the stresses and the loads of their daily activities, whether it be sports or just regular activities, are uh, imparted to the lower portion of the spine or the upper portion where the motion is preserved as, as opposed to the area where that has been fixed and fused. So we've now uh, entered the realm 
of non-fusion scoliosis correction. And I have been fortunate to be at the, the front edge of this with colleagues around the world. There are only um, a few of us uh, really that have taken the lead. And I think there'll be more and more surgeons in the future that will take uh, uh, hold uh, of this approach. And that is non-fusion scoliosis correction in which for the tether procedure, and this was FDA approved only last summer uh, in, in August actually of 2019. And with that procedure, which we've been performing for five years before FDA approval, it was off label, but we've been going through the patient's side. We do this through uh, small incisions using a scope and a camera. It's really minimally invasive in that sense. And we place screws into the vertebra uh, into the building blocks of the spine and then connect them with a flexible tether or like a cord or a rope. And we get correction of the spine. And then with growth, the child's spine corrects further because you're holding the growth a little bit on that curved side and it straightens out a little more on the inside of the curve. So that's a process called growth modulation. And, uh, that has been a, a procedure in which the patients recover relatively quickly, a lot quicker than with spinal fusion. Uh, there's been very <clears throat> little blood loss. In fact, none of our pediatric patients have had a blood transfusion in the uh, nearly 350 cases that we've performed and we've had no infections. And the patients get back to their sports and dance and activities by six weeks. We get them into a swimming pool at four weeks. So it's very, very different than the spinal fusion patients, which take months to recover. And again, they end up with a, a fusion or a non-mobile spine. The other area is Apifix. And this also was approved around the same time as the, the spinal tether, FDA approved. It's been used in Europe, in some centers and in Israel. And the Apifix device is a bit different. These, this is more for patients who are, have failed bracing or unable to tolerate bracing for moderate curves that then become more severe. And what we do, instead of going through the side, we go from the back of the spine and we place two screws at the upper end of the curve and one screw at the lower end. And we place a device that ratchets open and elongates so that we can correct the curve, but it, it, it maintains mobility of the spine and the patients have <clears throat> retained their their motion for the most part and their ability to carry on with their, their daily activities. This is a little bit of a, uh, maybe a quicker recovery even than the tether. Um, and we, there are trade-offs of the two procedures. And so we offer them based on the individual's specific needs and the family's uh, desires and needs. We still offer spinal fusion because tether and apifix are not for all patients. Not all patients have the right indication and also some families prefer the standard procedure, which has been with us for, for quite some time and they're they are more comfortable with it. So it really becomes individualized care in our program. So I've done, and my team has done quite a bit of research over, in my case, 25 years and our team has been really instrumental in bringing forth new innovations and, and making sure that we're constantly improving the safety and efficiency of, of the operations and improving outcomes for our patients. So our focus now really has been on non-fusion corrections and how we can optimize the patient and how they have the best possible outcomes, how we can improve the corrections, how we can improve their recovery. Uh, and that's going to be the focus, I think, for the next 15 or 20 years of my career, if I'm so lucky to have that. Um, I think that we need to really determine the best indications for these new procedures and um, how long the, these outcomes will remain positive because we've seen really excellent outcomes, but now we need time and follow up to, to uh, be able to report back to our patients and to the doctors uh, that we train in these procedures so that they have the clearest path to provide the best solutions for, for the patients. So that's our focus, non-fusion and improving safety of the procedures. I'm actually just a one member of a, a large team and our team uh, consists of uh, pediatric hospitalists, intensive care doctors, 
physical therapists, nurses, of course, the nurses are very, very instrumental and crucial and they're at the bedside constantly. They're right there next to the patients and their families, social workers, occupational therapists. There's so many people, the people who deliver the, the food to the bedside, child life specialists who bring the dog around and uh, visit with the patient. We have music therapy. So we have a musical um, individuals who play musical instruments and sing and bring that to the patients. Now it's with a mask, but uh, they're still doing that. And I think that helps to ease the stress and, and somewhat the, the, the pain of recovery and makes it a more smooth uh, experience for the patients. I think that's one thing that we do really well at Mount Sinai, and that is recognizing the individual and the family and trying to provide compassionate uh, care to the families. We meet uh, with our multidisciplinary team at least quarterly, but really uh, pretty much daily and discuss patients. But the quarterly meetings are to discuss protocols so that we're constantly improving our protocols so that the, the patients have the best experience possible. To me, this is really uh, very important. We see patients from around the world. <clears throat> they, families may have different accents and different customs and different foods uh, that they like, but for the most part, in general, families want the same thing. They want their child to, to have as little pain and suffering as possible, to have a good life, to have a full life, to get an education, things like that. And that's those are universal concepts. But each family has its own individual needs and desires and aspirations and uh, tolerance for, for uh, unknowns and knowns. You know, this is a new procedure. The non-fusion corrections are relatively new. So that may not be for every family. So it's really crucial in order to have the best outcomes, and align the expectations of the patient and the parents and the families with those recommendations that we make and their, their act, the procedure they choose. And so we've done a lot of research in this. Uh, the patient generated index, for example, is an outcomes tool, a questionnaire that the patients create themselves and the parents create themselves that outline the most important areas of their lives that are affected by the scoliosis. It could be my ability to play sports. It could be my anxiety or, or stress about having scoliosis and what the future holds. It could be having uh, less pain or no pain uh, now or in the future. And so we customize the questionnaires and then we try to address the concerns of the, the patient and the family in our treatment uh, recommendations. So this is gonna be a whole area. We're doing a patient preference survey now uh, with the FDA in which we're trying to understand better family preferences for fusion versus non-fusion scoliosis correction. And we're also creating a decision tool which will help families in their decision making. Should I choose the Apifix? Should we choose the Tether? Should we choose standard fusion operation? And we're going to do some videotaping and of sessions with families and uh, working with, in collaboration with the FDA, come uh, up and, and create a, a decision tool that will hopefully make, simplify the process for the families. Well, I think physicians should first and foremost refer patients because the patients are gonna be cared for well. That's the most important thing. Being uh, skilled is important, but also being available and being compassionate is really important. Every surgical patient that I operate on, the family gets my personal phone number and they text or call me uh, weekends, nights, if they have questions or concerns. So my team and I are available 24 seven and of course the hospital team is 24 seven. So we're, we're, we're available, we're compassionate, and we address issues if and when they arise. And then we, we provide options, we provide alternatives. We're not stuck in one, uh, one realm and one treatment type just because we've done it that way for a hundred years. And uh, I'm open to uh, providing new solutions and new options for families and reporting to them what we know about those solutions and options and what we don't know and what the safety profile is. And then it's up to the family in consultation with myself and my team to come up with the best option for themselves, for their own child. So 
the pediatrician will also have access uh, to me and the team, have my phone number and I, in our uh, annual mailings, they, they're given my cell phone number and, and many of them do call me. So we're available and we're open to uh, giving talks and, and uh, discussing individual patients as well for the pediatricians and other referring doctors.